Seifer, who will be the, the next voice uh, after our New Testament reading. Uh, the Reverend Roshana Austria will be with us four times this year. She's been with us once already, uh, albeit we were virtual on that day. So this is the first time that we've had Roshana with us when a lot of us were not wearing sweatpants and stuff. Uh, so happy to have her back. There are a lot of things that I could tell you about Lashana. Uh, she is beloved in the Southern Conference, known as a teller of the truth, and we can never have too many of those, and we seldom do. Uh, she uh, is unflinching and courageous as an organizer toward social, environmental, and racial justice. All of these things are true and important, but none of them are the most important thing that I have to tell you about Shauna today. It is her birthday. <laughs> and so, Robert, I'm going to turn my microphone off, and let's... Uh, Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son of the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil." For all who do evil hate the light and who hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This ends the reading. I did this. I hear myself, so I did the microphone correctly because I hear my voice. Um, good morning to y'all, and thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the Zoom service the last time I was with you, and I'm glad to be with you in person today. Uh, it was a long, beautiful drive from Burlington, and I came alone. Um, I do have a big family, but I came alone because I told them um, I just need some birthday time to myself. Uh, I want to enjoy the drive. Y'all, you know, I said, you're welcome to come, but I'm cool just doing this alone and coming back home to whatever birthday surprise. And I said, it also gives you time to get that ready. <laughs> um, and so my husband sends his love, um, my three children that live at home, with me uh, and my oldest son. So I imagine they'll be with me the next time. Uh, I may not want to drive, but ride the next time I come over. But it was a really beautiful drive, and it gives me an opportunity to sing and reflect and think. And that's something that I don't get to do by myself too much due to the work I do and the fact that I have a house full of people. I'm hardly ever alone. So it was really good. And thank you for the birthday greetings. I will continue in my tradition 
uh, in the black church, we would testify on our birthday. And so I'm going to testify this morning and say, I'm so glad that God woke me up this morning, that I'm clothed and in my right mind. It is something that I do not take for granted. Even at the age of 44 today, I know that there are plenty of people who have not lived to this age. And so I take nothing for granted. I think about COVID-19 over the past two years, I could be dead. And I'm not. I'm alive and well, and for that I'm grateful. I'll tell you a little bit about me because I don't think we've had an opportunity to do much of that. Uh, so we'll skip any kind of formal introductions going forward. I'll tell you enough today to last the rest of the year. <laughs> I was born April 3rd, 1978 to a mother who could not take care of me and a father who was incarcerated. And I was raised by my grandmother and my great grandmother and they loved me so much. I have an older brother whose birthday is actually tomorrow, and he'll be 46. He's two years older than me. Um, and we were both raised by our, grand, by our grandmother and great-grandmother. And I was raised in a little town called Melville uh, in Alamance County. So I've been in Alamance County all my life. <clears throat> and I went to uh, public schools. And I remember at the end of uh, uh, maybe 11th grade, actually, the end of 11th grade, my high school counselor said, well, Shauna, you are not college material. You should be all you can be and go to the Army. And I went to the Army, and I spent a few years in the Army, and I thought I met the love of my life, and I quickly got pregnant and thought that this is going to be my journey, and I had my first kid at 19. Uh, and so he will be 25 this year, and his mother is 44. And then because, you know, young people, we do things and we think we're, um, you know, we're grown up and we're not. Thankfully, my kids aren't here right now. Um, went on to follow him to um, Fayetteville and he was uh, in the military. So I ended up getting out not too long after I had Malik. So I was in there a couple of years uh, and, and found myself with yet another baby. But this time it was after uh, the love of my life had tried to murder me um, and strangled me until I blacked out and my aunt told me if you don't leave him this time I'll kill you myself <laughs> and I believed her and so now young young mother of two I'm now working at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill go Tar Heels yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Uh, I love you too, Duke fans, and we'll talk about that after church. But yay, this is a, a good day to be a Tar Heel and to drive an hour and a half in the Carolina blue sky. Uh, and so I went to UNC. Grandma said, you got to work, honey. You got babies. You got to go to work. So I went to work. And I worked there for over 10 years, and that's where I met my husband, Reggie. And uh, as a mother, single mother at the time, um, I, I didn't know uh, how to love, and I didn't know if I was lovable after going through such a hard time. But I met Reggie. I didn't give him a second look. He was a short, brown man, uh, and he was in college at UNC, and I'm a young mom working at UNC. And so uh, I didn't give him a second look. I'm a mom. I'm not really even thinking about relationship at this point in my life. Uh, but I went on maternity leave and had, had my second child and came back and, uh, to work. And sure enough, Reggie was standing at my desk. And he said, well, I saw those balloons at your desk. And I was wondering what was going on. I said, well, my birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks. He said, well, let me take you out. And I said, oh. OK. So our first date was at uh, Applebee's in Chapel Hill years ago. Um, and. Uh, didn't know much about the Philippines at the time, didn't know much about uh, being a wife or really even being a mom, just trying to get through in life. And Reggie and I got married a year later, um, but we went out uh, 21 years ago on my birthday, uh, and then we've been married for 20 years in February. And so uh, that's a little bit about me. And what I want you to know is that today I'm, I'm most proud uh, of being a wife and a mom. 
Uh, I didn't think I could do it. Didn't even think I had it in me. Um, but I, I've, I've, I've been an okay mama. I think my kids would say that. I've been an okay mama. I've, I've, I've tried, I've made mistakes and struggles along the way and struggled being a wife along the way. Um, but I'm most, I'm most proud of my children who are almost 25, uh, almost 22, almost 20 and almost 17. In just a few months, everybody will have a birthday. Um, and, and I'm also proud um, that even in the church, I survived being a young mother, uh, not married, having both black children and biracial children, uh, making my way through all of the red tape to become ordained in the UCC, and standing up for justice in the midst of it when my youngest son came out gay. And so as a young black mother, I had to stand up and tell folks in the black church, folks in all church, uh, that they weren't going to treat my child any kind of way. That I may have been young, I may have made mistakes, um, but the love that comes from my belly for my child, um, I'll stand with him any day, any time. And so um, I'm excited to see him later on. But I wanted to tell you all a little bit about my story. There's so much more um, that I could stand here all day and you won't hear the sermon. And so we won't do that. But uh, the next time I come, I'll, I'll pick up. I'll pick up where I've left off today um, in telling you a little bit about me. But thanks for the birthday wishes. I feel real good today. And I'm glad to celebrate with y'all. Uh, also in my tradition, I would likely uh, think about a song. And I've kind of been sitting here, and oh, and the music was beautiful today, y'all. Uh, somebody told me that maybe there's one person that couldn't be here that's really important in music. I didn't know it, and it was great to me. It felt, it felt good. It felt warm. Uh, and I appreciate just, I come from a music tradition. I come from a church tradition where we value music, where we sing a lot, where we carry on and clap and do all those kinds of things. And so it really makes me feel good when I can enter into a space where folks are singing and smiles on their faces and enjoying each other. Um, I appreciate you. But I think I want to just give you a little piece of um, a song that I was raised singing in the church. Um, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Pray with me. God, we thank you. This is a day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Thank you for those who are situated in this building. Thank you for the little ones playing and carrying on like little children ought to. We know preaching ain't easy. Mm, it sure ain't easy. But we know the Holy Spirit is fresh, renewed, abundant, and always abiding. And we thank you for our elder brother, JC, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, I appreciate, I cannot remember your name. I'm, I'm also grateful for not having too much paper because I printed 
six pieces today, and I'm very careful and mindful of paper. I've uh, been doing a purge for the past two years of paper in my home. Um, but thank you, young, brilliant, beautiful person who read the scripture. I cannot remember her name. Um, but thank you. And, uh, and, and this is a scripture, y'all, that I really struggled with. I ain't going to lie. Uh, quoted a lot in, our, in church, um, but, but still some kind of, John, I want to love you, but I just don't know if I can. That's the kind of relationship I have with the Apostle John. And so I think I'll start by saying that uh, in, 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 in church, in, in Christianity, we have to begin to grapple with the popular image of Jesus. That image of Jesus that kind of floats out in Christianity that we sometimes embrace and don't question. Um, and, and that image is of a Jesus um, who's only partially human, that he's a figure up here in the sky, that there's this some kind of angelic uh, 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 person, but not fully human. And so today I come to reject that outright, that in order for me to continue to embrace my elder brother, J.C., he got to just be human like me, fully human like me understanding the struggles that I go through, fully human like me. So for a long time, many of us, in the, uh, in, particularly in the American church, we've actually aided and abetted the injustice by means of, of that kind of gospel thinking that Jesus isn't fully human. And so that kind of gospel uh, promises nothing but escape to a better world. Y'all heard it before. Uh, for those who believe in Jesus, we're going to live long and prosper in heaven when I get to heaven. And it's really resonant in the black church as well, and for maybe different reasons than what we might see in other churches. However, it's still really, really resonant. And so, you know, some believe that the humanity of Christ uh, was only an appearance, uh, the church rejected this view, some churches did, you know, in part because it seemed to limit the effects of Christ's redemptive work. How are you going to redeem me and you're not fully human? How? I don't know. You know, if Christ didn't become fully human, then how could, how could he have healed our full humanity? How does he heal our full humanity? And so when we don't embrace the fullness of the gospel, we only get a partial and incomplete salvation. Because really, it only addresses one aspect of our humanity, and that's our souls. And I know my soul is part of my humanity, but that's not all of it, y'all. When I stump my toe, that ain't my soul. That's my toe. <laughs> you know, when my heart is breaking, that's not my soul. That's my heart, right? And so we have to begin to grapple. And I'm hoping that by the time I finish today, you will be more curious and grapple. I don't come with any solutions but I want you to be curious enough to keep on fumbling through this life that we are living and exploring new possibilities. So um, Christianity at, it, at its most extreme form would tell us that humanity is nothing but a mass of individual souls um, faced with a dramatic choice between heaven and hell. Christology tells us how Christ paid the price so that souls won't have to go to hell. Uh, and, and creation, including our bodies, including our physical bodies, is a mere stage for the drama of individual choices for or against Christ. And so, I think this gospel can think of, uh, uh, can think of economic and, and, and political realities only in terms of abstract individual choices. For this journey... It's a, a primary operative category, whether it's a, a, a economic or, or political, it's really about individual choices. Mm. This kind of gospel has nothing to say then when the poor are blamed for their condition. How convenient for empires of all kinds when we have that kind of thinking, y'all. When, when, when their policies leave the poor to suffer without health care, 
uh, without employment, without justice, without earthly hope, the gospel follows along willingly. And when our own American empire, black bodies like mine are incarcerated at alarming rates and effectively denied citizenship, the gospel does nothing to object it. The gospel has no way of conceptualizing human beings other than as isolated individual actors. All it can say is that uh, uh, oppressed individuals should have chosen a different or perhaps a better path, and oh, how unfortunate it is for them. That kind of gospel has nothing to say when uh, multinational corporations dominate local economies and governments. Not a word. What a sweet setup for the executives and investors. Ain't that good? Mm, that's a setup, y'all. And so when corporations exploit the labor and lives of human beings, the gospel will stand right on by, on the sidelines, with our hands crossed, just like Saul at the stoning of Stephen. Mm. We got a lot of work to do as Christians. And so if individuals don't like their employment conditions, the gospel teaches that they should find another job or hope for Jesus' return. Because, you know, he's coming back real soon. We all got to be ready when Jesus comes. But it can't speak to the injustice of those conditions. For it can only, it can only see individuals and their decisions abstracted from all social and economic context. That kind of gospel has nothing to say. When financial gain uh, motivates the development of deadly weapons and their ability, their availability rather, throughout the entire world. How blessed are those uh, Lockheed Martin and the National Rifle Association? How lucky are they that we as Christians with that kind of gospel don't mind sitting on the sidelines, offering thoughts and prayers with our prayer visuals and nothing to stop the atrocities from happening in the first place. Mm. It can only wring its hands and offer its regrets without thoughts of the lives of the children who have been gunned down in schools where they ought to be safe Learning a place of joy turns into a place of mass destruction. That kind of gospel has nothing to say about the destruction and the degradation of the planet and its non-human inhabitants. What a fortunate coincidence for ExxonMobil and Tyson and Monsanto. Mm. When we, uh, 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 when, when we are, 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 are looking at the cruelties that are happening to other creatures on this planet, uh, how it uh, decimates habitats throughout mountaintop, uh, with, with our mountaintop removals, deplete the soil with industrial agriculture, the gospel is too busy saving souls to even notice what's going on right in front of us. None of those useful animals are expendable. Ecosystems are going to heaven anyway. We all got to die. That's what we say. That's what we say. But y'all, today is my birthday. Mm, mm, mm. And I'm so glad that I get the opportunity to tell y'all the good news of the gospel. So glad. So glad that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that kind of gospel. Thank God that Jesus Christ took on a full, hallelujah, full human nature so that our entire human nature could be healed. There is a possibility of the gospel for you and me. And that's the good news. That human nature is fundamentally embodied it's inherently related to and embedded in the rest of creation from which it cannot be separated, y'all. 
That's why Isaiah didn't preach of our future escape from the world, but of a future when the wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, and the then the lion, and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. That's the good news. That's why the apocalypse of John didn't speak only of the destruction of the world. Read it again. No, it's not just about destruction. We stop there, but it says a new heaven and a new earth of which it can be said, see, I make all things new. This is why the epistle of the Romans affirms that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of of the children of God. Most of us understand uh, what it means to struggle for personal goodness on our way to our individual journeys through life, trusting that not knowing quite uh, how to struggle will continue to, 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 to help transform our future. We're all struggling. I tell my kids all the time, mama's on the struggle bus with you. We're all struggling and fumbling and trying to make our way through and all the things happening in our world. How are we going to survive? What's this pandemic going to do? Can we have enough money? Do we have enough food? We're all struggling. <clears throat> trying to make it through. Trying to make hard decisions. Trying to love right. Trying to teach our children right. Trying to set an example. We're all in this together. How then, how then are we to understand this week's gospel reading, which seems to proclaim that kind of gospel? In order to recover a present possibility reading of John 3.16, we need to read it in the context of the rest of the book of John. You got to read the whole story, y'all. You know, we're, and preachers are so good at it. We'll pull a scripture out in a heartbeat and you know, try to make our point and make our case. But for today, we got to read. We need to know who John is. That's the first point. Know where his perspective is and know what he's trying to tell his readers and listeners. So we got to go back and we got to read the whole thing. And, 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 and we got to read it uh, in light of its connection to the story of Moses and the bronze serpent. Some of y'all heard that story. And so it's common to understand the difference between these passages as a matter of timing. One is the Old Testament, one is the New Testament. We get all that. The Israelites are saved immediately from poisonous serpents. And we see, and, and, and we will be saved from hell in the future, but this is not what John means by eternal life. We get it all wrong when we misinterpret and we don't put it in proper context and see who's writing. Who's telling the story? What's their background? And what are they really trying to say to us? John, for John, eternal life is a present possibility. Present possibility. The, uh, uh, the transition from death to life takes place here and now. And those who, uh, who believe in Jesus, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. The present possibility of the gospel of John affirms the real possibility for eternal life for you and me in this life. Eternal life consists of knowing the only true God and Jesus the Christ, whom God sent in full human fashion. That knowledge is available right now to you and me. So when John says, just as Moses lifted up the, servant, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whomever believes in him may have eternal life. The comparison is quite direct, y'all. In both cases, the immediate result is gaining life. Hallelujah. That's the good news. And avoiding perishing. Hallelujah. That's the good news. And if the comparison with Moses' serpent is taken seriously, eternal life must also be embodied life, even though it can't be reduced to our mere biological survival. It's complicated. Ain't that complicated? 
right? It's so complex, but it's so good because that includes me and that includes you and everyone here today. So the present possibility gospel of Jesus Christ means that the church must preach not just for what will happen in the future, but the life available presently through the power that raised the body of Jesus from the dead. We got to talk about what's happening right now, y'all. We're coming into church buildings, having services, and not talking about Ukraine, not talking about folks dying in war, not talking about what's happening in our world. Shame on us. Shame on us. If we're not talking about what is happening right now, affecting each and every one of us, no matter our race or ethnicity, no matter our socio socioeconomic status, we all going through something. And where should we be uh, hearing those messages of hope and love and joy and how we can continue to press our way even in the midst of darkness? Right here on Sunday morning. Anything else is going through the motion. Anything else is kind of raggedy. Anything else is not speaking to the true humanity of Jesus Christ and our humanity right now. Yeah, I want to live in heaven. I want to see my grandma one day. I want to see my great grandma. They loved me good. Raised me when my mama couldn't. Raised me when my daddy wouldn't. But ultimately, I got to live right now. Today, I got to live. Today, I've got to figure out how to do something to help us along on our journey. Today, and if I wake up tomorrow, tomorrow, I got to do the same thing again. No more watered down sermons. No more coming in kumbaya. No more status quo. No more that kind of gospel. We need to be living in a present gospel that resonates. I remember reading in the Bible where it says, from my belly would flow rivers of living water. And I did. Rivers of living water. And that's what I've dedicated the rest of my life to. I don't know how long I have on earth. No clue. But if I keep getting up, if I keep putting my feet on the floor, if I keep standing up, going out into the world, I've decided that rivers of living water ought to flow from my belly into my community, into all of the surrounding area that I live in, into the world. It's available for you and for me. The present possibility of the gospel means that the church must preach not just of heaven, but of right now. Life available presently through the power that raised Jesus. We're only a few weeks away. I'm an Easter people too, so this is real good for me. Raise Jesus from the dead. And to the extent that our bodies participate in that life, so, so may we, uh, uh, we, we understand that we have been created to participate in this present possibility gospel. Our bodies are nothing uh, uh, if, we don't, if we are only thinking about heaven later on and not what we're doing right now. And so in closing... We can be foretasters of liberation. That liberation will eventually be realized for all creation if we participate in it. That liberation includes not only the physical realities of which human life is part of, but social and economic realities too. The gospel of Jesus proclaims that all of creation, all of creation, is bound, uh, uh, bound up as it may be with our bodies and how we live as humans, it's all subject to Christ and healed by Christ. And so it's our task to live out the reality 
that the gospel by, uh, of this kind of present possibility gospel, we got to live it out by anticipating the present and the future restoration of everything. Everything. Have you looked at our climate situation lately? Have you looked at our economic situation lately? Everything needs to be restored. Nothing is right. Nothing is operating as God intended for it to. So we got a lot of work to do as Christian believers. For that future restoration, uh, uh, we, we can say right now, today, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Amen. I think Michelle.